Welcome to The Current, your online show for the latest in entertainment, music, sports, technology. On today's show, we've got one of my Twitter friends, Jason Romano, joining us. Jason is an ESPN talent producer. He's in charge of booking all the guests that you see on shows like ESPN's First Take, Mike and Mike in the Morning, and Sports Nation. He's just an all-around great guy, and uh, he took some time to talk to some of the younger professionals out there to kind of instruct them on what they can do to position themselves to work at a company like ESPN or a major news network. I had a little bit of technical difficulties with, I have difficulties here myself, a little technical difficulties with the interview from my end. So I'm just going to post Jason's video and audio and you'll hear me prompting the questions. So um, that is all coming up here on this week's episode of The Current. Well, on today's show, I'd like to welcome our guest, Jason Romano. Jason is the ESPN senior talent producer. Jason, after you know connecting on Twitter for so long, it's nice to finally meet you, man. Thanks for coming on. Dan, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's nice to have a fellow Star Wars lover around. So, <laughs> absolutely. I, I still have my Millennium Falcon back in the room here uh, from when I was six years old, still. So. Oh. That's amazing. I've been a diehard for many years. Good. That's good to know. Yeah, I'm bummed the uh, celebration's coming to Orlando next weekend, but we're having our all-pro dad in Indianapolis, so I'm oh. going to get to miss that. I'll actually be going to the celebration. Are you really? I am, yes. Dang. I haven't put that out on Twitter or anything, but I am uh, going to Orlando next week and spending four days in the lovely central Florida and going to Star Wars Celebration 6. I'm super excited. Dang, I might have to, uh, I think we get back Saturday. Maybe I can meet you up there Sunday or something. Yeah, or, you know, even somewhere else. We'll have to figure something out, definitely. Okay, awesome. cool, man. Well, um, I explained a little bit about, you know, what a talent producer does, but I'd love to hear from you, like in your words, what you exactly do. Sure. Um, I basically am in charge, well, myself and, and six of us, six other talent producers at ESPN are in charge of the bookings and the guests that you see on the various ESPN shows from Mike and Mike to Sports Center to NFL Live to First Take to Sports Nation. We basically set up all the guests that you see on all the different shows uh, at ESPN. Cool. So you just like hang out with celebrities all day pretty much? <laughs> that's like 10% of what I do, but it's like <laughs> everybody thinks that's what my job is, is just walk around <laughs> celebrities at ESPN all day. But that is part of what we do. Um, we have a thing called the ESPN Car Wash, mm -hmm. which isn't an actual car wash. It's a, it's what we call a day at ESPN when celebrities and athletes and and musicians come through and and spend a day going through different shows. Uh, you know, my group and myself, we set up the schedule, and put a good day to the, together for them. And then when they come to ESPN, we take them around and make sure they get from show to show, uh, on time and and make sure that everything goes smoothly. Cool. Well, I'm sure when like a lot of people hear that, they're like, oh, you know, that's such a cool job. How do I get a job like that? Um, what is kind of some of the details on your journey on how you got to where you are and some maybe advice for newcomers that you would have? Sure. I'll start with my journey first. I've been at ESPN for 12 years. Um, I got there July of 2000. So last month it was my 12th anniversary. Okay. I started out uh, when I got out of college. I wanted to be on the air. I didn't know what to do to kind of get on the air. So I started um, volunteering at a local radio station in Albany, New York, where I'm from. And a couple months I did that, I realized when I was around some of these pretty talented on-air people that I didn't quite have what it takes <laughs> to, uh, to, well, at least in my eyes, to be that great. Maybe I could have gone back and worked at it. But mm -hmm. I realized quickly as I was doing behind the scenes work that I was pretty good at at producing and doing some of the behind the scenes stuff that people don't quite see. So uh, I kind of dove into that work. I got my first full time job in radio at that radio station in Albany as a producer in the afternoon talk show. I uh, moved to the morning talk show, uh, was sort of a sidekick, but basically the producer of that as well. And then in 2000, got a job at ESPN starting in radio. And I got my, my start uh, on the Mike and Mike show, which a lot of people know all about. Um, but they were in their infancy then. They were about eight months old at the time. And I was hired and basically brought in as their booker. And I booked guests on Mike and Mike. I probably booked six or seven guests a day. Uh, it was a very heavily booked show at the time. It's a little less uh, guest-oriented right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I booked on that show for about eight months and then went and produced my own uh, radio show, The Evening Show on ESPN Radio. 
for two years from there. So with that experience in the booking and the producing and networking and making contacts in uh, was I guess it would have been November of 2003, uh, I applied and got the job as a talent producer at ESPN. Now, the talent producer job, which I explained earlier as basically booking the guests, was only about a year old. The, the, overall, the job is only 10 years old at this point. So it's, it's a fairly new job at ESPN. So have you kind of like pioneered that job there? Like yeah, I was, I was the third overall talent producer ever hired, and the two before me aren't here anymore. So okay. I'm the, okay. the veteran talent producer at ESPN as far as that goes. Cool. And I've seen the job sort of change flight from booking on just one show to five of us now or six of us booking 24 shows at ESPN. Um, so it's grown quite a bit over the past nine years that I've been doing it. Um, as far as, you know, what, what advice I would have to, to people say, if you want to do this job for a living, I suggest you, um, first of all, make sure that you don't want to be on the air because if you do, I always say pursue that avenue first and exhaust every, every possibility you can to want to be on the air before you're certain that, you know, that door is shut. Um, but if you're behind the scenes and you're kind of, you know, realizing that you don't necessarily want to be on the air or whatever, just go to local radio stations, uh, television stations and, and shadow them, learn from them, volunteer, give them as much time as you can. And in that process, you'll see, um, sort of how producing works. And then as you're producing, you'll build your contacts and your Rolodex and your database. You'll, you'll make contacts throughout the industry in various forms and then as far as sports goes if you look if you started on a local sports radio station for example you know you'll begin to to network and develop those contacts you know in whatever area that is whether it's miami or boston or whatever city you're working in and then from there um it's just a matter of opportunity uh, a lot of it is is circumstance and i don't like the word luck because i don't believe in luck but i do believe that it you know doors open for a reason and i think a lot of it has to do with um, timing and being in the right place at the right time and um, you know when a job opens up maybe knowing someone I mean I truly believe there's a lot of people at ESPN mm -hmm. who have jobs because they knew somebody and, and is that fair or not I don't know but it's the truth and the more people you can network and learn and meet uh, it's going to help you in better position you to get the better job but what I would say is I didn't really have this opportunity 10, 12, 15 years ago when I was coming up because there wasn't anything called Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or even what we're doing on Skype. None of this existed. Uh, so the networking was a lot harder back then than it is now. Today, you have access to every single person you want to have access to in the industry. So there's really no excuse in you not um, putting your effort in to try and network with as many people as you can because they're all right there. Everybody's on Twitter. Everybody's on Facebook. And you can connect with them and at least just pick their brain you know if, if this person that you're trying to learn from is is willing enough you, it's it's an invaluable resource yes well again i thank you again for taking some time out and sharing no your insight um so to go with that how much is social media just changing the landscape of you know the mass media as a whole i mean look at all the cool things they're doing with the olympics this year um what do you see as kind of the future for broadcasting and media as a whole well, social media is 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 amazing. I'm I'm on it a lot. I utilize it. It's it's become almost your brand. You know, there's three different ways you can look. First of all, with the social media aspect, you know, like Twitter. You know, your Twitter can be your brand about you. It can also be a, a source for news. I mean, I use it as mm -hmm. as my new newspaper. You know, I'm mm -hmm. on there constantly checking and seeing what's what's out there as far as news goes. Um, and it's a great way to network with other people. You know, like I was saying earlier, the, the, you know, every, pretty much everybody in the media that I know is on Twitter. So there's no excuse for, for not, um, you know, knowing what's going on all around the country as far as in the industry that you work in. And Twitter is a great way to do that. So it's, it's changed the way we, we do things. I mean, it's even changed the way that I, I do my job because, um, I'm getting news faster on Twitter sometimes than I am on television. I'm mm -hmm. connecting and staying connected with various athletes and entertainers through Twitter that um, didn't exist five years ago. So it's it's changed that landscape. As far as the media um, goes in the future, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I hope television still exists because I need I need a <laughs> job. <Yeah. laughs> 
<laughs> it will. Um, but, you know, I was talking uh, with one of my bosses the other day, and he said he could see in 10, 15, 20 years everybody owned by Apple or Google or mm -hmm. something like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the big, big companies. So who knows where it's going to go someday. But the technology seems to be endless, and you're seeing snippets of that now, especially the way social media has been used with the Olympics and online and you know with um man it's been cool hasn't it your tablets it's been great yeah mm -hmm. I, I i'm not a huge olympics fan but mm -hmm. this year it's gotten you know as the olympics went along i missed the first week because i was away on vacation but it really has grown to a point where you know using twitter to kind of you know twitter has changed the way i watch television now too i may not be interested in a certain Olympic match, but if people are talking about it on Twitter, I may turn it on and watch. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's happened to you as well. Mm -hmm. So, it, in that sense, it could really change the way um, the whole entire media is done based upon social media. So, hmm. now how much now with that changing kind of everything, how much of the process of going to work for a company like ESPN or an NBC or ABC? How much of that has changed? Like, you know, when I was coming through college and internships, it was always like, you know, go start at the local station, build from there. Now do you, can you apply directly to ESPN out of college or, you know, what, is there a right way to do that nowadays? I got that, I got that question asked a lot. I talked to a lot of college kids, especially through Twitter um, and LinkedIn who contact me and ask me for advice. If you want to work at ESPN someday, you got to, you got to, first of all, coming out of college, it's, it's very difficult to just start your career at ESPN. Um, there are ways to do that, but there's not a lot of openings. You know, we have, in this, as far as studio production and, and the broadcast side of where I am goes, you basically start out as a production assistant mm -hmm. out of college. Um, that's the lowest rank as far as um, studio production goes, and you work your way up eventually to producer, and who knows how, how far you can end up. But production assistant is your basic startup job at ESPN. Now. I would say that they're probably bringing 15 to 20 a year, maybe. So that gives you an idea of how hard it is to get here. Um, a lot of it is who you know. A lot of it's the college you went to and some of the um, people who are above and making those decisions might have gone to that college. A lot of it has to do with recruiting. Um, there's a few people who are on Twitter who are the recruiting people at ESPN who work in human resources. Those people are invaluable. Those people are people that any college person who wants to work at ESPN should be in touch with now. Um, so I think those there's ways to do it. Again, I think my opinion, I still think the local route is the best way to do it for a couple of years. Really get your feet wet in how the industry works. And then, you know, without having sort of any pressure to move on, just kind of start to, you know, uh, connect with people who are where you want to be someday. And I think that local level is still a great place to start. Now, that's what I did, so I'm, I guess, a little biased that way. But mm -hmm. local, the local scene, I think, is a great startup point. You know, your local town, that you, wherever you go to college or wherever you live, there's always a TV station within an hour's drive. You know, go to those stations and, and just volunteer and learn. And if there's a job, great. You know, you'll get a job and start working. But even if it's not, you can, you can gain in you know great experience going to these local stations cool yeah because i think you know a lot of times I meet people and it's just you know i want to be here at an espn or major network but how do i bridge that gap between yeah. where i'm at now and then so that's yeah cool. I mean, again a lot of it's circumstance and who you know but i think you know there are not a lot of 21 and 22 year olds working at espn they just aren't at least from what i know of. Mm -hmm. and you know there's a few that come out of college and and you know you see them every so often but Many of them come from different different places, you know, different radio stations, different television stations, different companies that have nothing to do with the media, and they may get a break or two, you know. There's a lot of different places that you can work and not just be on the air, even be in production side. You can, like I said, you can work in marketing, you can work in, you know, public relations and human resources, and you can work in just various different avenues that can get you in the door. Mm -hmm. um, but experience is still always going to help you. Cool. Now, um, from your tweets and stuff, obviously, you know, it shows you're a man of faith. You're posting your Bible verses, you know, every morning, which has all been a big encouragement to me. So thank you for that. But um, what's it like, uh, you know, being a Christian in the sports entertainment world? What successes have you had and also challenges as well? 
Sure. I think um, it's funny. I started at ESPN in 2000, and at that time I was not a Christian. Um, okay. I had grown up Catholic, but I had certainly walked away from God, and I wasn't, you know, um, you know, I hadn't accepted Jesus into my life, and I hadn't really walked with God, uh, you know, closely like that. So I've seen sort of what it's done with me, and, um, you know, at first it was hard. There was a time where I didn't know if I was even supposed to be at ESPN, um, as a Christian, I really thought that maybe this wasn't the place for me. Maybe I was supposed to be working in a church or working in a, a ministry of some sorts. Um, but I realized this is the calling that God has in my life. And, uh, I was meant to be here. And when that door is meant to shut, it'll be clear to me that I have another opportunity somewhere else. But, um, right now this is where he wants me. Um, there are challenges certainly, uh, because you don't want to push your faith on anybody. That's, that's never, um, what we're called to do, we're called to love and we're called to um, be open about our faith, but not ever preachy about our faith, I think. And, you know, ESPN is a place where it has many denominations and many different backgrounds of people and religions. And, you know, you have to respect that. And I think if you love the person and you respect the person that you work with and they see that, um, you know, reflected in yourself, I think that's the, that's the best way I can be a Christian to somebody else and, be, and share my faith. Um, but, you know, I think that there's opportunities to, to talk to people about it. Um, but I think it can't get in the way of your business and your job. Um, you know, I I talk a lot about how I don't represent ESPN when I'm doing these things. I represent me. Um, and these aren't ESPN's words or anything like that. But Mm -hmm. I think when I go, when I go to my job, um, I, I wake up every day and I'm thankful and blessed that I work where I work. And, um, but I think that, at your job you have to do your job and that's what you're paid to do so you can do that as a christian you know be a man of integrity you know be honest um you know be you know show that joy you know that that might exist in your life uh but you do have to do your job and i think that that's the bottom line and you have to work with people who you may not want to work with or may not um sometimes be the the most friendly people or whatever uh, but if you, you know, if you just figure out a way to do it and realized that not everybody believes the same, but you can still, you know, respect that and respect each person you work with, then you're, I think you're fine. And that's kind of how I go about doing my job. Um, you know, it's, it's, I haven't really faced, I wouldn't say too many challenges. Okay. I mean, I, I, I know, know everybody there, let's put it this way, because of Twitter, I think most of my peers know my faith and know where I stand because I put my my faith very um, out you know out there on my Twitter page. So people know that I'm a man of faith. I think uh, people know where I stand as far as my beliefs and my and my love for God. But I don't ever, you know, like I said, I don't ever preach it. I don't ever um, rub push it into people's face. That's not my place to do that. Um, hopefully they see it in the way I act in my work and in the, in the effort that I put into my job and, you know, hopefully that glorifies God in that way. So, no, it's very cool. It's, uh, I think it's cool to hear, you know, there's always that struggle of, you know, I'm in kind of a very secular industry, but sure. there's still a lot of opportunities there for sure. So, yeah. I think, you know, there are a lot of people, it's funny when, you know, Again, I don't walk around wearing a big cross on my shirt or that. <laughs> Just a Tim, big Tim Tebow shirt. A big Tim Tebow shirt and walk around with my, <laughs> my head every day. But people know, and I think, you know, they respect that. I've had a lot of people come up to me and say, um, you know, I appreciate you being so open about your faith. And even some some people who are of the Jewish faith who may not understand or may not, um, certainly may not believe what I believe, but they respect that I have that passion for what I do believe. And, you know, if I, it's the same way with anybody. If I treat them the right way, then they're going to have that respect back. If I push it in their face and I'm in their face all the time about it, then maybe that's, you know, not the best way to go about it. But, you know, for the most part, everybody's very respectful, but they do compliment me or they do say things about it quite often at work from what they see on Twitter. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, I couldn't let you go without talking a little fantasy football here oh, sure. today. Um, it's that time of year again. Pretty crazy. Uh, who do you have as some as your breakout stars this year? Oh, breakout stars. Now, i got to be honest. I'm, I'm in two leagues as we speak, and I may end up going into a third. I have not had one draft yet, so I haven't 
Yeah, Del- it's still a little early, but yeah. It is a little early. Uh, I like to do my drafts, and I'm not a commissioner this year or anything, but I do like to do my drafts uh, right before the season starts because mm-hmm. of injuries and because Definitely. of transactions and things like that. But mm-hmm. we are doing a draft next Sunday, which will be – we're speaking on the 12th, so that will be the 19th, and I'm a little apprehensive to do our draft so early. Uh, but we are doing our draft. The sleepers, I, I have a few. I like uh, – the, the kid Julio Jones from the Falcons was a guy mm-hmm. about, you know, he's caught a pass in his first game the other day for a touchdown. I really like him to kind of surpass Roddy White this year as far as the main target on the Falcons. Um, well, I have to think for a minute, Dan. I'm sorry. I haven't, oh, it's all good, man. I mean, I think Cam Newton's going to have a, a really good year. I think he'll yeah, come a yeah. little bit back down to earth, but I think realistically he's going to be – you know, as long as he gives you what he gave last year and his interceptions go down after a, a full year, he's just going to be a top three quarterback every year. My number one pick, if I get the number one overall pick, I'm taking Aaron Rodgers all day long. I, I'm, I'm a huge Aaron Rodgers fan. I, lo- I thought he was the best player in the NFL last year. I think that he'll continue to do that. Um, I really like, gosh, I'm not high on any rookies this year like last year. I don't think Robert Griffin III or Andrew Luck will do – as far as quarterbacks go, I should say. I don't think that they'll do what Cam Newton did last year. I think they'll have nice years. Mm-hmm. But I'm not too sold on on them as far as, you know, high pick fantasy picks. Um, give me one. Let me think here. i got to give you one more guy. I one was more guy would be good. One more. Let me think here. All right. Because I was just doing my research last week. I, first time I picked up my fantasy football magazine, the ESPN the Magazine's preview issue was last week, and I started looking at it. And I was thinking about who I should pick. Um, I, you know what? I'll give you one. I really like Brandon Marshall. I mm, think yeah, Chicago, Bears look good, man. Yeah, and, and and he's reunited with Cutler, and I think in Chicago, Marshall, he's always had pretty good numbers without great quarterbacks in Miami. I think his numbers are going to go back to where they were in Denver when he was playing with Cutler. It could be a hundred receptions, could be like fourteen hundred yards, it could be like eight to ten touchdowns. I think his numbers will be real high this year, and Jay Cutler throwing to him is going to certainly help him. So I like Brandon Marshall a lot um, because he's really their only receiver. I mean, they have a couple of complimentary receivers, but he's going to get, I bet you, 15 balls thrown to him a game and probably catch 8 to 10. So, yeah, and they lock Forte up, so play and action. So. Up, which is going to help, yeah. And I think when you have Forte and you have Marshall and then you have Cutler, you know, I don't know if they can overtake the Packers, but the Bears are going to be pretty dangerous this year. Yeah. Do you ever uh, just like go down the hall and ask Matthew Barry or Eric Carabell for, for advice? Or you? Awesome. Yeah, all the time. I mean, <laughs> yeah. last year, last four years actually, on Sundays, my job um, as booking the NFL guests, I was in this war, what we call the war room at ESPN, and Matthew Barry would sit there every week with me. Another guy named Chris Harris, who also does some NFL stuff for fantasy football for us, would literally sit right next to me. So I would talk to Chris every week about should I start this guy? Should I start that guy? Who should I pick up? Who am I missing? What am I doing here? So I've had a lot of help, but um, I don't know. I think you, you can oversaturate your brain a little bit with what's going on. And Definitely. it just will come back and haunt you. So I think sometimes to try and keep it simple is probably the better best way. I do one more for you. I like Michael Vick to have a dynamite year. I think Vick could be what Man. everybody – he was going to be fantasy last I year. I picked him in your league first overall last year, and I think I won like two games. <laughs> <laughs> well, last year there were some high expectations with the whole uh, dream. No. Thing, and he didn't perform well, but if he doesn't get injured this year, his numbers could be the best of any quarterback because of his rushing and his touchdowns. Yeah, and I'll be interested to see if, you know, the team rallies around Andy Reid and all that too. It should, yes. be a, should be a fun year. Yes, it should be. I'm looking forward to it. Well, Jason, thanks so much, man, for coming on the show. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I hope all the viewers got some valuable insight on uh, the sports entertainment world. Make sure you follow Jason on Twitter, at Jason Romano. Yes. He's got some. Let me know what you think of this interview. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, constructive criticism. Yeah, give me some constructive criticism as well. <laughs> but, I'll, yeah, Jason Nassel, he's on Instagram too and gets some great uh, behind-the-scenes look at ESPN with Stormtroopers and Darth Vader and all that. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> yes, that was awesome. So, so definitely. Well, thanks, man, and uh, hopefully we'll get you back on the show soon. Dan, anytime. No problem. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for joining us here on The Current. I hope Jason's insight was just as valuable to you as it was to me. 
uh, just to hear everything he said from you know a top level guy in the entertainment business was just you know you can't put a price on it so I hope you are help and encouraged to uh, you know you really can chase your dreams and make it uh, in the entertainment world on next week's show we will have Tony Dungy he's just come back from the, the Olympics uh, with NBC wants to share with us you know stories highlights and of course talk about football in the upcoming season so make sure you stay tuned next week for Tony Dungy and we will see you on The Current.